All right, next up we have Matt Mills. Are you ready? I'm ready, they're ready. All righty. Adjust this up a little bit. Good evening. Uh, I'm Matt Mills, and I'm here to talk about Edison, the spiteful bastard. Now, to start off, I should warn you that this starts friendly and nerdy, and then it gets very ugly uh, towards the end. So just, you know, be prepared. Um, like I said, it starts friendly, uh, 1878. Uh, Professor Barker there with the amazing chops. Uh, hears that his friend Thomas Edison is looking for the next big thing. And he invites him over to his lab at the University of Pennsylvania and shows him his brand new dynamo and arc lights. He spins it up and he flicks the lights on and immediately the room is brilliantly illuminated. Illuminated, sorry. Um, and Edison is, is enraptured and he's, he's scribbling calculations and he's like, this is amazing, this is what I'm doing and I think I can do better. So, he goes back to his lab in Menlo Park. Oh. Oh no. <laughs> like hanging off. There we go. Fantastic. All right, he goes back to his lab in New Jersey and starts working on incandescent bulbs, which are a different kind of bulb than the professor showed him. Um, Basically, it had been known for a while that you could get a wire hot and it would glow, right? So he starts along that path and uh, has some pretty quick success with platinum filaments, which if you know anything about platinum, you know it's very expensive. And also, these bulbs burned out after like an hour. So he gave a bunch of demos to like try and, and interest investors, but he didn't really have a commercially acceptable filament for a couple of years. Uh, eventually, he hits on carbon filaments, like this one. Yay, it's still working. Uh, <laughs> this is a bamboo filament that's one of his uh, later bulbs. Um, you can tell because it's kind of like a U shape and that's in the patent as well. Um, he lights up lower Manhattan uh, and he also has to invent a whole industry to make this work, right? Like it's not just a light bulb, it's a light bulb and a fixture and the wires to get like electricity to the bulb um, and improving generators, all these things. He has to bootstrap a whole industry out of whole cloth. <laughs> all of that, yes. Uh, so Edison's system is a low voltage DC system, which means that power has to be generated within a half a mile of where it's used, which we'll come back to later. Um, Wow, that's really tiny. Uh, if you can see it, there's a little blue line there at the top of the graph. Um, and basically, that's a DC current. It's a steady flow in one direction. And, that, and that's all you get. <laughs> As opposed to some other systems that were used by other people. So this is alternating current. And as you can see, it alternates back and forth over the zero line. So it's going actually swapping directions in the wire. Uh, 60 times a second. And that didn't work. Oh, no, my slides aren't advancing. <laughs> All right. Uh, so for the first five years, Edison and his DC system dominate. Uh, if you're a rich person who wants to illuminate your house and get rid of gas lamp, if you're a factory, if you're a large mu municipality like New York that wants to light up the streets, you get Edison lights. Um, and he enjoys a lot of profit and a lot of fame for this. Uh, he's still famous today as an inventor because of it. Uh, but then a challenger appears. This is George Westinghouse. Um, again, fabulous chops. So uh, Westinghouse largely didn't engage in this war except to make a better system and to sell a lot of it. He said, quote, he didn't want to lower himself to the other man's game. Now, the main selling point in Westinghouse's system is this. This is a transformer, and it's a, a modern example because I couldn't find a picture of, West, uh, of uh, Westinghouse's. Uh, a transformer takes high voltage, 
uh, AC and turns it into lower voltage AC. So you can generate high voltage and send it a long way and then um, turn it to low voltage where it's going to be used so it's safer. Uh, it only works with AC because of that movement, that, that back and forth creates a magnetic flux. Um, and so he, he buys up the patents on transformers in America, and he also uh, buys Tesla's business, which is uh, AC motors and a bunch of other AC gadgets. Um, he chooses to make a higher voltage system because he knows it'll sell better. Edison hears about this and says um, that Westinghouse and his system will kill somebody within six months. And he doesn't just say this once. He gives many newspaper interviews. He has his own papers, published editorials. Of course, he owned newspapers because he's a capitalist. And his electric company published his, his own writing, an 80-page pamphlet about, uh, well, there it is on the cover, a warning from the Edison Electric Light Company about all of the other electricity that other people were selling that was inherently bad. Um, he said, it is a matter of fact that any high voltage AC system jeopardizes life. <laughs> that should be a new callback. <laughs> All right, so Edison at this point um, wants to control the electrical industry. He's enjoyed all the success. He's been right, or he's thought he was right for now half a decade. Um, but he can't win on technical grounds because AC is just so much better. Uh, he was already losing ground. Westinghouse, in a year of operation, had installed as many generation stations as Edison had in the first five. Uh, and so he's doing everything he can to discredit AC. And then um, a New York City electrician, Harold Brown, writes a letter to the editor of the Evening Post uh, that basically it was a wall of text of like, in an era when people were paid by the word, it was a lot of text. <laughs> um, but the, the long and the short is he advised the outlawing of voltages greater than 300 volts, which would make uh, all of the competing non-Edison systems basically unable to operate. Um, Edison sees this, and he's like, this is my guy to do my dirty work. And so he engages him as a proxy. Uh, he gives him lab space uh, and assistance from his top engineers to prove the dangers of AC. And this is where it gets ugly. Uh, I have deliberately made a blank slide. The image has been omitted due to graphic content. What they did in the lab is they collected stray dogs. They paid local boys like a quarter apiece to bring them in and then uh, experimented electrocuting them with, yeah, with uh, varying levels of AC and DC. It, it's bad. It's bad. And then, they decided after six months of this work that they needed to show, show their work, demo to the press, um, and they, they electrocuted one dog uh, in front of the press, and a member of the ASPCA that was in the audience stopped the proceedings, like physically got in their way and refused to let it proceed. Um, now, not only, not only did they kill the dog, they rigged the game. They used higher amperage AC, uh, which is more wattage and more death, according to my notes. <laughs> um, one group that wasn't, um, wasn't repulsed was the Medical Legal Society, which had been established by the state of New York to get a better method of execution than hanging, which had been botched several times and is just ugly in general. Uh, and they had settled on electricity already. The leader of the group, this man, Alfred Southwick, was the inventor of the electric chair. Um, also a dentist, so, you know. <laughs> so, <laughs> they, um, they see Brown's work and they realize that he's probably the foremost expert on killing things with electricity. And so they hire him to set up the, the three different state penitentiaries where they had death rows. Um, and also, through their contact with him, they, they, they got Edison to write a testimonial. And of course, Edison doesn't miss an opportunity. He says, the most suitable, most effective machines are known as alternating machines manufactured by George Westinghouse. 
So in 1889, uh, New York State passes the electric chair as the official method of execution. And then, uh, 1890, the man in the beard there, uh, William Kemmler, he murdered his wife with an axe and was sentenced to die. Um, and this is Westinghouse's only involvement in the whole thing. He paid like very high-powered lawyers to uh, make Kemmler's appeals uh, to try and prevent the execution. Um, so, morning of the execution, he comes in, he's strapped down, they turn on the current. 17 seconds, they turn it off. And then they realize he's not dead. So they panic and spin the dynamo back up and turn him on for two minutes. Uh, the, the accounts sort of conflict. So it's possible he caught fire, it's possibly just smoldered, but the smell was unbearable and people ran out of the room. Uh, New York Times the next day said, far worse than hanging. So this was pretty much the end for uh, Edison in electricity. He was ousted in a merger that year. Uh, he lost his majority ownership and leadership. They took his name off the company, which was probably the worst for him. Uh, the editor of Electrical Engineer Mag, uh, T. Comerford Martin said, Edison lost his company because of the attitude taken and persistently held towards AC distribution. Edison set his face against it from the first and has sought on every possible occasion to discredit it, but the tide would not turn back at his frown. And so with that, I would like to raise a glass to Westinghouse and not playing the other man's game. Thank you. Ah. So, uh, Matt, According to my calculations, <laughs> science, science, I know, um, I'm advanced. This is your third talk. Indeed. So it is perhaps time, assuming you consent, for you to consent. Hot damn, to be inducted into the fellowship. <laughs> 